Good morning, and thank you for joining us in worship at Church Street United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us online. We pray that you are well and healthy and safe, and we are honored to have you as part of our congregation this morning. Let us open our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship Almighty God. join me in our call to worship. Come into this sacred space to worship God, whose teaching is perfect, whose directions are sure. Come into this holy place to worship God, whose standards are right, whose commandment is clear, whose judgments are true. Come with holy fear to be given life and made wise, to have your heart stirred and your eyes opened wide. Come, let us worship God. Let the words of our mouths and the whisperings of our hearts be according to your will, O God. Amen. I invite you now to sing with us our opening hymn, Lift High the Cross.
nation this morning. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is Mark 8, 27 through 38, and I am reading from the Common English Bible. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that will be ashamed of that person when he comes into his father's glory with the holy angels. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if Jesus was rude to the Syrophoenician woman last week in our story, he is over the top in his rebuke with Peter, isn't he? Peter has just correctly called Jesus the Christ, the title which means anointed one, Messiah. Then Jesus calls Peter Satan. <laughs> what happened? In between the name calling, there is more conversation, and we'll look at that for a little bit. We are smack dab in the middle of Mark's gospel today, and this is a real turning point. The conflict or the assertion, the profession that clearly defines who Jesus is and who the disciples are. Mark titles his gospel, The Good News of Jesus Christ, we, the readers, get to see that, but for Peter and everyone else, they don't hear the word Christ until now. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? The disciples repeat back some of the rumors that have been going around. Some say you are Elijah or some other prophet. Some say you are John the Baptist returned from the dead. What does this fisherman, Peter, know about messianic expectations? He works day in and day out providing for his family. Maybe it's along the seashore from other people that he has heard stories of the one who will come to save them, the one who will come to restore Israel. Maybe he heard stories as a child about God sending a deliverer a Messiah to make things right. Had God forgotten about his promises to restore the kingdom of David? These seem like stories from a long time ago, perhaps for Peter. But yet, when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter summons all of his hope, all of his courage, and dares to speak, you are the Christ. Now when Matthew is the storyteller, he gives Peter some status after this answer, and Peter's answer is a little longer and the conversation is longer, but we are in Mark, and the conversations aren't long, but they are full. Who do you say that I am? The Christ. Don't tell anyone about me, 
Jesus says. We never fully understand why Jesus asks for silence from his disciples and from those he heals. Word seems to get out regardless. Does Jesus know that people will truly not understand, not know, not grasp who he is until after the resurrection? What resurrection? <laughs> the disciples know nothing of this. We read these stories 2,000 years later and think how foolish, how shallow, how silly, how scared the disciples are. But this is the first time Jesus has mentioned death and resurrection. Honestly, I think the disciples are doing the very best they can do. Who do you say that I am? The Christ. Jesus' command to tell no one about him must give Peter a clue that Peter is on the right track. This is the one. He will deliver us. The Roman Empire is going to be turned upside down. Things are going to be different. Peter doesn't say all of this, but for once is speechless as he begins to imagine this new world order, his place in it, and what it might mean for his family and for his friends, realizing that he is standing in the presence of the Christ. And then Jesus talks to them privately about all that he must go through. Jesus uses son of man to refer to himself. It literally means a human being, a human one, but we can't help but hear the prophet Ezekiel who uses son of man to refer to himself, a prophet to whom God is speaking or a prophet through whom God is speaking. Son of man, can't help but hear echoes from the book of Daniel in those older translations, an apocalyptic figure who comes to restore, to make things right. Whatever Jesus means by this, he is referring to himself and no one else. Of that, Peter is very certain. And we can understand his reaction. When Jesus says that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again, Peter may not have even heard the part about resurrection, and if he did, would he have understood? Why does there need to be death in the first place? I can see Peter, as impetuous as he is, at least pulling Jesus off to the side a bit. Jesus, don't talk like this. This is not the way for someone of your stature. This is not the way the Messiah talks. This is not going to happen to the Christ. You are the anointed one. Jesus looks at the other disciples, so I think he includes all of them in his rebuke, just in case the others of you are thinking the same thing. Get behind me, Satan. As we have followed Jesus in Mark's gospel, we have seen an extraordinary teacher, one with authority. We have seen an exorcist who can cast out all kinds of demons. We have seen a healer restoring not just broken bodies, but life itself. Healer, teacher, weather changer, miraculous food provider, that is how we have seen him. But now Jesus talks about his death, being destroyed by the powers that are in charge, being destroyed, killed by those, by institutions who define us who give us meaning. And Jesus says to be a disciple, we are to follow him into that death. Jesus will redefine what true power is on the third day. But hearing this for the first time is very difficult. Jesus makes it clear that the kingdom, his kingdom is not of this world, but God's kingdom is about clear choices of living living for self or living for others. Deny yourself and follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. There is nothing else. There is no way to make this easier or better. There is no way to make this a, a better branding or for the group or a more positive message. This is it, Peter. Choose.
I think of the choices that you and I have each day, difficult choices. Where has the shadow of the cross loomed before us? I think about, well, just this morning, difficult choices I've had to make. I had my little coffee canister was empty. So I opened the cabinet. I have two bags of coffee. One is that $8 bag. It was on sale, not my favorite brand, but I'm trying to be more economical and spend less mon money at the store so I can have more money to give to the church. Or I can open up the bag that costs nearly $13, which is delicious, and it's fair trade and organic, and it helps the farmers. And this company's pledge on the back says that they care about the farmers and the earth, so the extra four or five dollars for that bag of coffee is well worth it. I could feel good about drinking it. Or I could just come on to church and stop at a, a new coffee shop near me. I want to support local business and encourage those entrepreneurs. But then I know the guy at Starbucks, and I know they're good to their employees, even though they're a corporation that's still helping local business, but the drive through is longer, so my engine would be idling more. Oh, good grief, the decisions, the choices that I have to make, these impossible decisions that I am faced with each day. I imagine Jesus does not really care about my angst over coffee choices, but is more concerned, or maybe a little amused, or embarrassed by the number of choices I do have and the amount of energy I spend on such choices. I am facing my day as a consumer with choices. That's who I am. I am a consumer. I face my day as a privileged citizen who does not want to be inconvenienced much but is willing to help others a bit. I face my day as a mother and a wife who puts those relationships as a priority, and I want to keep the lines of communication open and to assure my children and my husband that I love them and they are important and they are my joy. I face my day as a minister who struggles to wonder if people are still listening or are they just tired from everything. Coffee choices and pandemics and Afghanistan and climate disasters. How can I make discipleship more appealing in the midst of all that? What if instead I began my day with, I am a follower of Jesus Christ? Then perhaps my eyes would be open to the adversary. That is what Satan means, the adversary. I can look at Satan and deal with him when he is a horned, spiked tail, slobbering, slithering monster. I can deal with Satan when he gives me clear choices between hate and love and good and evil. But you see, I really have not had to encounter that Satan very often, if, if at all. Remember when Jesus encountered Satan in the wilderness? He offered him good things food, power. We are used to encountering smooth talking friends, folks with convincing arguments about why this or that is a good thing to do or a better way. I encounter the voices that say, you're doing really good work. That's important. You're making a difference with your coffee or your barbecue sauce or whatever else. We have so many choices. I have conversation with voices that say, you can make this appealing. Jesus doesn't want you to worry about this. Jesus wants you to be happy and be fulfilled. Jesus wants you to be self-actualized and, and feel at peace with your consumer choices and be happy about your relationships. Well, what's wrong with all that, you ask? Well, it's all about me. It starts with me and how I feel and how I'm measuring things and what I call successful and good. How many times when Jesus is talking clearly about the cross do I pull him aside and suggest that he talk about things that are more relevant, easier to listen to, things that are happening in my life, my insecurities, my hopes, my hurts, 
I would like a Messiah that is convenient and more helpful to me. My interrupting Jesus and redirecting him and, and Peter's correction probably say more about what we are wanting from Jesus. I want someone on my side, someone I am comfortable with, a Messiah who is easy to get along with, a Messiah that puts all those Pharisees in their place and tells them off and comes in and kicks Caesar off the throne and says, there's a new emperor in town. Now that's the way the Christ should be. Am I embarrassed or as Jesus says, ashamed? that the Christ is not more appealing, more adaptive, more get along to get ahead. The Son of Man, the Christ, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Otherwise, he is not the Christ, he would be simply playing into what the world has defined as right and good and powerful. And that is so tempting for, for me. Jesus is asking Peter and the disciples and us, who do you say that I am? How would... I have answered that question if I had been standing with Peter that day. I don't know. It's difficult to pretend that I don't know what I know now. The thing is, Jesus is asking us that question today. Even though I profess each Sunday that I believe in the resurrection, am I willing to follow Am I willing to live in a way that professes that I trust the life-giving death of Jesus more than I trust the life-depleting powers that are so tempting to believe in? Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Amen. Will you join me in our prayer this morning? Creator of heaven and earth, like the original disciples, we continue to wrestle with the calling of Christ. We are eager to name Jesus as our Messiah, the Savior and King, but it is revealed to us that the path Jesus leads us upon is filled with sacrifice, loss, and suffering love. We seek the protection of power and the renown of prestige. Our hearts brim with enthusiasm to follow Jesus when we believe his ways will grant us power and influence. Forgive us when our hearts are bent inwards and our service is for self and not others. May your Holy Spirit abide within our church family and lead us into humble obedience. We pray for all those connected to Church Street United Methodist Church. Empower and guide this community that we would know Jesus within our community and proclaim him to the world. Grant that we might answer the invitation to follow Jesus. We pray for all those whose obedience to you has resulted in suffering. Give us confidence in Christ's promises that we would boldly pick up our crosses and follow after him. Comfort the persecuted and instruct us in the care and support of one another. We pray for those who do not share the faith of the church. When our institutions and hierarchies become a stumbling block for others, Pluck out that which is blinding us to faithful living. Make your mercy and grace known to those who feel far from your love and send your disciples into the midst of the world and away from the comforts that shelter us from following Jesus. We pray for all those who suffer, who are alone or are in any kind of trouble. Christ's willingness to suffer is a sign of his commitment to the world Christ entered the suffering of the world out of love for all that which God has made. May our hearts be softened, that we too may encounter suffering ourselves, so that God's love might be made known. We pray for the sick, the dying, 
the scared, the angry, the disappointed, the oppressed, and those whose suffering is hidden. May your mercy be upon the nations. We remember this weekend the loss and pain of one horrific event that reshaped our world 20 years ago. We pray for the leaders of nations and of peoples, that your peace may transform the world. We pray for all those who have known war and violence. We pray for our own leaders, for the president, the governor, the county and city mayors, all elected officials and those they appoint. And let us hold fast to the blessed hope of your kingdom, O Lord. May we be willing to lose all else for the sake of gaining Christ. Let our hopes be grounded in the vision that Christ cast in the prayer which he taught us as we pray together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we go into a new week together, may you know full well the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and for always. Amen.